James, did you intend to end your life? It was just darkness. I died. And the next second, here we are. Our perceptions can deceive us. The manual is our only certainty. Hey, everybody. Uh, Thank you so much for listening. I have a couple of special guests on the line with me. Uh, If you are a listener of the regular show, you know that we recently reviewed a short film called The Manual, which we all really enjoyed. Um, I have the filmmakers, Will and Sarah Magnus, with me. How you doing? Good. Great. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. We, uh, like I said, we really enjoyed the movie, and I kind of wanted to hear a little more about how this came about. So, if you could kind of give me the backstory of the manual and what it is. Yeah, totally. Um, uh, first off, thanks so much for doing the review. That was really fun listening to you guys, kind of chatting about it and hearing the things that didn't work for some of you, and then the things that did. It was pretty cool for us. I think. Yeah. Yeah, um, it definitely was a cut above most of the shorts that we get to see. So thanks oh, for cool. sharing it with us. Great to hear. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I, I started uh, working on the story, I think, three years ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it started off, the plan was for it to be sort of an animation um, about a little boy and being raised by a robot on a on a spaceship that was just kind of hurtling through nowhere, you know? Um, and I think as the story, as I started working on the story more and more and, um, making it into something that was a bit more personal, it kind of grounded it more in reality and became something that could potentially be live action and have, you know, some people in it. Um, and it first, it first really became a real thing, I think like a year and a half ago when, um, I was chatting with Kevin, who's the director of photography. I was just telling him about the story and stuff, and he was like, and he he just told me that he would love to shoot it, and I was like, oh, wow, this could actually be a real thing. And so it just sort of continued from there. Yeah, there's also the fact... Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah, go ahead. There was just also the fact that doing even like a 10-minute animation by yourself in a room is... It might be like a decade-long process, so (laughs) shooting a live action would be more practical if we actually wanted to do the project. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think you really, um, you, you mentioned your DP, he was out of this world. I, I The photography on this is so good. Is this somebody you've worked with before? Yeah, I've, I've worked with him on a couple of uh, commercial projects before, and we really hit it off. He's he's amazing. Yeah, what was his name again? His name is Kevin Fletcher. Yeah, he's he's really got an eye for... I don't even I like when you sent me the trailer originally, I, I was just the thing that hooked me in. A lot of it was the photography of it. It's just so beautifully shot. Um, and a lot of times people will your setting is, you know, essentially the woods for a lot of it. And sometimes I, I think a lot of photographers, when they make a short because the woods is a it's a common backdrop for a lot of uh you know, um, of horror shorts, whereas I would consider this more of a hard sci-fi story. Like, um, a lot of times they forget the opportunity uh, of making that, uh, pulling the beauty out of all the surroundings and everything, you know, it's just a convenient location. Whereas I think your, your short, uh, visually, again, that's the thing that I think that blew me away was the combination of the photography and also, um, the, the costuming, especially of machine, and I kind of wanted to ask about that too. Like, how did you come up with the look of Machine, the robot who is raising uh, our hero character? Yeah, um, yeah. Just talking about kind of the forest. What you were saying before we go into the machine costume, 
Um, Kevin and I spent a long time figuring out every shot. Yeah. And and with a big emphasis on trying to create a world where sort of nature has taken it back from humans. And so trying to make the forest as sort of lush and overgrown and beautiful as possible. Where And then going to the more city areas and just making those kind of drained and of color. And um, so I think that, yeah, he did a great job with that. And I think you guys, like, they really um, applied a, a creative process that was um, very um, meticulous and um, with, like, rounds of, of really going over things. And there wasn't, like, this, I think you, because Will and Kevin have worked together in this other, you know, commercial world, it's like they had that process sort of established with each other. And it wasn't this um, this attempt to just, like, do everything as quickly and as fast as possible. I mean, I mean... Yeah. Kevin basically worked for free, which is what was the one of the greatest <laughs> things that helped the look of the film for a low budget film. But um that was that was a huge part of it. It's just like going over things and really applying, you know, treating it as if it was like, you know, um a full blown commercial shoot and someone's yeah. paying you millions of dollars to do it. I feel like that was a huge part of it. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean I think mainly because we were paying for it ourselves. We really wanted to make sure that we got the most bang for our buck and so really planned it out. Yeah, the um, when you were talking about when you leave the, the forest setting and you're in the urban settings, you, you guys did a really great job of like scouting locations for that kind of that dystopian look of everything. It had, yeah. a, it had a very big feel to it for such a, um, like you were saying, for something that was essentially DIY- filmmaking i did not i like it i didn't expect that when they when they get into the city i'm like this looks like something out of planet of the apes or something yeah yeah, yeah. it was yeah it's cool we found that or uh, sarah i have kudos to sarah for that she did a lot of work on the locations yeah we found an old abandoned or not it wasn't actually abandoned it's still sort of working but a paper mill in oregon city that basically uh had like seven, seven, 75% of those locations were in this one spot yeah. of this paper mill. It was mill. just, it's so massive. There were so many different pieces that we could go to and um, get that look. But we also had a beautiful camera, which um, yeah. Kerner Camera gave to us via, um, via Kevin. So we, we had a lot of, we pulled a lot of favors to accomplish the look. Yeah. I don't know if that'll happen again next time. We'll have to. <laughs> I hope so. It, it, I think this speaks to, um, this is a great advertisement for the, for the camera even, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Like if I, if I were an indie filmmaker and I saw this, I would want to know like, okay, how did they get this done? Because it's yeah. really beautiful. And um, speaking of that paper mill, you said it's still working. I, I couldn't imagine going to work in a place like that. That would be so dreary. <laughs> it's just like, it's not, it's not really working. <laughs> the site that are still operational but um yeah. most of it is being cleared away for a new city project so oh okay because i was like yeah that was definitely like some uh some mad max stuff there yeah <laughs> yeah it might not be legal to work in most of those buildings <laughs> <laughs> so um uh, let's get to machine because i i was really kind of fascinated with the look of machine um yeah. so th so the the concept for the machine um the brief that we kind of gave the um, the costume designer and builder people, which is um, just a shout out to Melissa DiMartino and Matt Hopkins, who put that all together. Um, we wanted them to make something that seemed like it could have been built by Apple, but had was pretty like worse for wear and had gone through a lot of sort of self repairs. You know, yeah. so like pieces of trash that were connected in diff this place and that. And um, so like an original, like simple, sleek design that then has been through a lot was the idea for that. And then you have this great companion prop, the manual itself, which it seems like you went with a slightly different direction aesthetically from machine with the manual, which I thought was a really cool choice with the analog knobs and everything. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, that was cool. So uh, the manual is essentially their Bible, right? So, yeah, yeah the I manual think. is kind of like a. It's a. It's funny because there's excerpts from the manual in voiceover throughout the film, and that wasn't originally part of the of the idea. Um, I did. I wrote like a ten, like a ten to fifteen page manual, which was just for the actors to read and kind of get a sense of what would be in it. Um, and then when we 
were putting the film together, we realized that it felt like there was a big part missing to not have little, at least a, a sense of what that religion was. It's so. funny that you should say that because as an audience member, that plays as the most important piece yeah. thematically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the fact that Will went and wrote this, like, you know, sacred text essentially for the film, I think that really gave um, the actors this, this like backstory that they needed to really be in, in that world. But, yes. but the choice to use that um, piece of equipment to represent the manual was something that sort of happened um, pretty close to shooting and it worked out for us. I think we all sort of visualized, like all the production crew kind of visualized it being this like, like tattered book. Right. But, yeah. but then at the, but at the last minute we decided, no, that's not the right way to go. And I don't think that was really a last minute thing. Cause Nate, Nate, uh, Nate Smith was our production designer and he was kind of instrumental in putting all these props together. And he and I went to this junk store that was like 20 minutes outside of town. He was like, Oh, you got to come with me to this place. And it just has all these like knickknacks and stuff. And we were just like taking pieces of things and putting them together and like, Oh, how could this fit? And then, um, and yeah, the, I mean, the idea of having a more analog kind of, I, I initially, I wanted it to be sort of an L one of those, you know, you know, those digital watches, LCD, is that what it's called? Where yeah. they're, um, yeah, initially we wanted to be like a sort of an LCD readout. I thought that would be cool, but then it became something that like didn't read very well and was kind of hard to hard to figure out. Yeah. And so we went back to this more um, knobby thing, which I, I think ended up being really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely it, it's got that rugged. It makes sense that this artifact has has sustained and, and survived this rough life they have because it's like this metal box it's chunky and it seems like it's it's heavy duty it makes sense you know that it would it would pass from one generation to another because it's so significant uh material wise um yeah this this is just when you get into uh, to me again uh, this plays as like a religious allegory i I don't know like you said that almost feels like that organically kind of happened as you worked on the project that it you know the religious overtones kind of came into it I think, yeah, I think as it became, um, initially it had nothing to do with religion. As I was working over the script more and more, um, I think that for me, anyhow, there was this, I think that a lot of people have this um, moment in their lives where you're raised a certain way and you have this worldview that's sort of formed by your parents and your community. And at a certain point in your life, you start to sort of get out of that and experience new things experience uh you know talking to people with different backgrounds and and you start to form your own uh worldview you transition to this new thing and that's the kind of the feeling that i wanted to capture in this thing it was like a huge moment for me and i think a lot of people go through that yeah jj sort of has that existential crisis but then what he finds is far worse than (laughs) um than just having believed in the religion to begin with anyway yeah sarah j speaking of jj uh that's another place where this short shines um jj johnston playing your lead he's so good where did you find him he's fantastic yeah we did a um he's amazing we did a casting and we i think sorted through a lot of people and originally he um he came and was going to play the machine because he was older than what we were looking for for the main character so he came in and auditioned for the machine and we were like my god this guy is the yeah best he actor by far yeah. and we were like okay he we just we we're like let's make this guy older so he totally looks like he could be the older version of our child who had to play the child version of of um of him of jj so uh you know, and that was obviously a um, consideration, a, a cost choice <laughs> to use our own child in the film. Anyway, so he, they, it worked perfectly, and he was definitely the best. He was so committed to the part that he had um, intended to live in the cabin that we shot in for a couple days before shooting. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he actually did that. He actually went out there and tried to spend the night there, but 
apparently some somebody who lived nearby kept like sort of coming over to the cabin and knocking on the door and being like, hey, like wanting to hang out with him. So he was like, oh, <laughs> this is not going to work. He wanted to hang out and drink beers with him. And so JJ could not get in the character and ended up having to go. He home. had to like drive. He actually drove away and went to some other forest somewhere and just hung out. <laughs> he couldn't find solitude <laughs> yeah. in the middle of the woods. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, funny. But, but JJ and Lauren and I went through, I think we did three sort of rehearsals, not where we were necessarily going through the script, but just kind of getting into character and figuring out what their um, relationship was and sort of forming memories with each other and stuff. And they both were really into it, like 200%. It was yeah. amazing to work with them. Yeah. Now, is Lauren also the voice of Machine? Yeah, she's, she's the full Machine personality. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, because uh, the physicality, you know, uh, you hear that all the time when the costume character, but um, really, really well done. Not not too not too stiff that, you know, that it's it, it's almost like a, a step down from um, uh, C-3PO, right. a little more humanity than that, um, which yeah. I think plays really well because she's kind of the motherly character. Right. Yeah, I feel like I um, sort of put her through some difficult times because I just, I, I, the way that I directed her was whenever she would go, I kept kind of going back and forth, like not being very, very clear in terms of my articulation. Like I would say, okay, a little more human, a little more robot. Let's <laughs> stiffen this. And so I think that it, it, in the moment I was like, man, am I not doing this well? But I think, Looking back on it, I think that my strategy, uh, you know, because she pay, had to be off. both. Essentially, she had to be both. She needed to be human enough for him to feel that connection, but she needed to be robot enough for it to alienate him as well. So yeah. I think it really did. Yeah, you guys definitely nailed it. Um, I, if you can't tell from here, I, I really am in love with this short. I thought it was fantastic. Um, uh, probably the best short film that I've seen all year, um, and the the i don't want to spoil the ending i i i did the ending for it for me left me wanting so much more uh story which is a yeah. which is a good thing like i, I because i thought it, you have a very traditional almost like twilight zone style of storytelling in this short mm -hmm. where you know obviously you're building to some sort of answer right right and the answer that you give is satisfying, but man, I, it hints at such a bigger story outside of this. And I'm wondering, is this a project that is, is wrapped and done, or is this something you're looking to expand on? Um, I, the, I don't have plans to expand on that universe right now, but I wouldn't say that it's wrapped and done. There's, there is a whole sort of universe around the story that, uh, we came up with and, I think is pretty compelling, yeah. but um, uh, we're we're working on a couple projects now. Sarah and I are both um, in the midst of writing our uh, respective scripts, and I don't know ex much about hers, but mine mine is similar in tone to this short, I would say, and um, touches on some similar subjects. So I think that if people enjoy this short, they'll probably be into watching this uh, longer piece that I'm working on writing now and uh i i gotta say i'm real excited to see what both of you do going forward and i, I think it's neat that it's this is a family affair for you um yeah. i love yeah. that because I, I i can sympathize with that because amy and i were married and we do this show together and everything and i think that um you know that really brings a little something extra special to it yeah that's awesome that's how we fell in love we yeah. were working on you know gorilla Stuff. films with our all the people we could possibly convince to work with us <laughs> and, and will ended up being one of those people so yeah 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 and you got this wonderful keepsake with your son too which is yeah. really neat yeah we're, it's funny we're terrible about like getting family videos and pictures Post apocalyptic <laughs> film of him trying to get out <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty neat. Yeah, he'll uh, he'll have something really cool to show his friends when he's in high school for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, where can people see the manual? So, um, 
Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> we are currently um, waiting to hear back from a bunch of festivals. We've gotten into, uh, we've heard back from Rome International Film Festival. So it looks like that's where it's going to premiere. That's in Rome, Georgia. Yeah, not and Rome, it, Italy. Just yeah. <laughs> Um, that way. Yeah, it sounds a little cooler to be at Rome, Italy, but Rome, Georgia is awesome too. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to look up when that is starting? And then, as so, I think, and then we'll be releasing it on demand. I think Vimeo on demand for like maybe buck fifty or two bucks or something. We haven't figured it out yet. Um, oh, wow, um, so and that'll probably be like March of twenty eighteen. Is the yeah, thought. we've kind of just started the festival process, so we're waiting for a lot of those. But we're d- planning on releasing it online in tandem with that because, um, yeah, because you know why wait? And then um, also, um, you want to talk about Matt Schulte and the Hotel East? Oh Park. yes, also um, this is if, for if you're in Portland, Oregon, for all you Portland listeners, um, it's going to be playing at a. There's a channel at the Hotel Eastland that Lower Boom. Um, puts together they do a lot of like Oregon independent film things and they have a channel on this at this hotel and the manual is going to be headlining that for their fall uh program yeah he puts together like a channel um for different hotels and I think it's right now it's the hotel Eastland that if you are if you stay at that hotel you can like watch flip to the channel and watch uh independent Oregon stuff that is really cool yeah so So this is kind of our beginning but um we should people if they want to see it they should go to the website and we'll be posting where we're um yeah so if you want to see it you can sign up to get notified about where it's going to be playing and stuff and if you just go to magnus.tv slash the manual film um you can you can get become a part of that (laughs) and it's worth it do it because uh Anyone who is a, you know, a fan, like I was saying, a fan of traditional, like hard sci fi storytelling, Ridley Scott fans, um, people who are into the Twilight Zone, uh, I think you'll really enjoy this. It's so, so well done, just all around great. Thank you so much for sending it to me. I really appreciate having the opportunity to see it. Yeah, Thank thanks you. so much Thank for having us on and taking a look at the film. It's yeah. uh, really fun. Yeah, definitely keep us posted going forward on what's uh, what's coming out next and how things are going with the festivals. Okay, cool. great. <laughs> Thanks again. Uh, that's Will and Sarah Magnus, creators of the manual. That is magnus.tv. You can find uh, everything there, right? And, yeah. And you guys are on, uh, I assume you're on Facebook and Twitter and everything. Yeah, we're. Uh, I think we got a Facebook page and an Instagram page for the manual. Yeah, so yeah. check those we're out gonna- too. <laughs> yeah, I'm not very good at that. <laughs> That's all right. Home guy, less of a social guy. You, you got the important stuff down. <laughs> cool. All right, thank you, Freddie. Hey, thank you, you bet. Thanks again. Yeah.